Super, thank you. Hoping you can all see that. There we go, yeah. So yes. um, without further ado, I shall crack on. So as long as there has been art, there have been forgeries. They are two sides of the same coin, and where an art market flourishes, so too does its counterpart, the world of fakes, imitations, replicas, and forgeries. Naturally, after curators discern that an object in a collection is a forgery, the object is normally removed from exhibit, and this process is repeated in auction houses and galleries worldwide. It is the natural response to the detection of a work deemed a forgery in any public face and capacity, subsequently confined to museum stores and brushed under the carpet as much as possible. Forgery, however, is not just a modern phenomenon. Art has been copied, misattributed and forged since before biblical times, continuing to cast a shadow upon the art world and bastions of culture across the globe. It is a perpetual game of cat and mouse between those that create fraudulent works of art and those that aim to uphold the values of the pursuit of historically accurate knowledge in galleries and museums. And it's a game that will continue for time immemorial. Authenticity is often grounded within three core principles that have independently evolved over time, but when synthesized with each other, form a steadfast case for the authenticity of a work of art. The three aspects of authenticity, the holy trinity, if you will, consist of the expert opinion, scientific analysis, and provenance. It is clear that there is an undisputed need for reliable, state-of-the-art analysis in authentication issues, and to provide absolute proof of the authenticity of an artwork, either through experts, forensic science, or provenance, is nigh on impossible. The provenance of much Russian avant-garde art is a complete black hole, as under Stalin's increasingly draconian regime in the 1930s, artists either had to comply with the demands of the state propaganda machine for socialist realist art, emigrate, or work in secret and non-compliant works, including much of the avant-garde, ended up in museum basements. Many artworks of the Russian avant-garde were not destroyed, and museums understood the cultural and artistic value of them, so many do survive to this day. However, the problem is that many artworks no longer have any provenance, as much of it was destroyed or simply lost while the works went into hiding across the Soviet Union. Fraudsters often take advantage of the lack of reliable documentation and can relatively easily create a convincingly sound paper trail. On the other hand, the market for Russian avant-garde art developed in the 1970s and flowered with the collapse of the Soviet Union, yet many legitimate works began to surface, often unaccompanied by provenance documentation. This inevitably causes a catch-22 situation, whereby the lack of complete provenance is enough to declare a work a forgery, as much as a complete provenance history can suggest it has been forged. There appears to be no easy way to solve this problem. Now, two notable artworks that highlight the myriad difficulties associated with authenticating the Russian avant-garde are Wrestlers by Natalia Goncharova and Peacocks by Mikhail Ryonov. These artists were lifelong partners and two of the most influential painters of the Russian avant-garde movement. Although they were both born in Russia, they left for the West and settled in Paris in 1915, where they would remain until Goncharova's death in 1962 and Larionov's death in 1964. Their work was deemed unacceptable in the former Soviet Socialist Republics and was swirled away in Russia after their departure, only to be discovered years later, and as such, many do not have complete provenance. Subsequently, their authenticity has been brought into question. Natalia Goncharova is one of the most celebrated female artists of all time, and certainly Russia's most famous female artist. Throughout her lifetime, she created hundreds of works of art that are now all over the world in museums, galleries, and private collections. One such work from a private collection is Wrestlers, painted in 1910 when Goncharova was still in Russia. Compositionally, Re wrestlers references a contemporary photograph of the international French wrestling competition of 1910 that was held in Warsaw, Moscow and St. Petersburg. It would not have been unusual for Goncharova to work from photographic sources since her partner Larionov was deeply influenced by photography and they worked very closely together. It is one of a small series of bigger paintings executed by Goncharova in the period around 1910 and other works in the series are now in the Musée National d'Art Moderne and the Tretrakov Gallery. In 2008, wrestlers underwent scientific analysis performed by Professor Elizabeth and Dr. Erhard Jaegers in their laboratory in Bornheim, Germany. The focus of their investigation was on the identification of the pigments and the binder used, and for this purpose, small paint particles were deliberately removed and examined. 
The results showed that all materials were known through the second decade of the 20th century and widely used as artist paints, with the youngest pigment, cadmium red, commercially available from 1910, the same year that Bressus was painted. It was also found that the binder had polymerized and aged evenly, consistent with what would be expected of a painting of its age. Wrestlers is fortunate enough to have a largely comprehensive provenance history. In the sale listing for Wrestlers in 2009, a complete history of the ownership of the artwork since 1935 was recorded, where it has moved through different private collections from Russia to America and then to Israel, where it has been since 1991. Now, Wrestles was included in Anthony Partman's monograph, Goncharova, the art and design of Natalia Goncharova, and published in 2010. However, in April 2011, yes, less than a year after publication, he became aware that the Russian oligarch, Peter Arvin, had organised a televised press conference in Moscow, where the book was subject for discussion. Claims were made that the curators at the Tretrikov Gallery in Moscow have calculated the number of fakes at about 150 of the approximately 600 works illustrated, and Parton was not invited to defend his work. Over the coming months and years, they continued to challenge the expertise of Parton, most notably in June 2013, when James Butterwick, a British art dealer who is also Peter Arvin's spokesman and buyer, gave a public address in London arranged by the organisation Russian Art and Culture. Butterwick suggests that because Ressus is clearly influenced by a photograph from 1910, it makes the painting inauthentic, despite the fact that it was part of the extensive research that brought this photograph to life. In March 2015, the Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation wrote to the publisher of Parton's book, which included the painting Ressus, to ask that the sales were withdrawn in the territories of the Russian Federation. It was agreed between Parton and the publisher that it was best to withdraw the book from sale immediately. However, a month later, the arbitration court of the city of Moscow wrote to the publisher to inform them that the case was going to court. Ultimately, there is no way to entirely prove that Wrestlers is an authentic work from the brush of Natalia Gontarova. On one side, there is the State Tretrikov Gallery and its supporters, proffering that works included in Parton's book were part of a grand scale operation, criminal in its essence, also supported by the Russian Ministry of Culture. On the other side, Parton has been researching the work of Natalia Goncharova and Mikhail Leonov for over 30 years. Scientific analysis of Bresler supported the view that the painting was by Goncharova and the provenance trail is comprehensive. Yet there are a number of people and organisations in Russia that dispute this information and despite evidence to the contrary, continue to support the idea that Parton's attributions are not confirmed by any documents and are not based on facts. Parton notes that over the past 15 years, the environment has become increasingly hostile to academic scholarship since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, when the market began to be flooded with artwork of the Russian avant-garde, creating an incredibly volatile atmosphere whenever a new work appeared. This was indeed the situation for our next case study, Peacocks, by Mikhail Larionov, whose authenticity has also been brought into question. Mikhail Larionov was a tour de force in the Russian avant-garde and central to the development of a number of radical avant-garde movements in Russia in the early 20th century. Larionov's series of peacocks is a particularly well-known series in museums across Russia and private collections across the world. One of these paintings from a private collection is peacocks, painted between 1908 and 1909, when Larionov was still in Russia. The peacock paintings form a discrete series in their own right and are a subject Larionov returned to again and again at an important point in his artistic career, and so they also document his stylistic developments. Some of the works from this series shown here can be found in the Omsk State Museum and Art Gallery, the Tretrikov Gallery, and a private collection. In 2005, peacocks underwent scientific analysis at a laboratory in Germany. The results showed that all materials were known and well used as artist materials in the first quarter of the 20th century. Now, importantly, the binding material of the paint layers had uniformly aged. Therefore, the results of analysis are not contradictory to an attribution of the painting of Mikhail Larionov. Frustratingly, Peacocks does not have a comprehensive provenance, one of the central reasons why its authenticity has been brought into question. On the back of Peacocks, shown here, there are a number of interesting markings, in particular a purple stamp in Cyrillic on the top right hand corner of the canvas. And it is thought that this stamp identifies the painting as one that was transferred from an organisation called Isoma Kompros to a provincial museum in 1928. In 1919, the Kompros founded the Museum of Artistic Culture. 
a process of democratizing art then began in Russia, where Russian art was shipped out to provincial museums and galleries across the Soviet Union. It is believed that Peacock was one of over 10,000 artworks that were distributed, although it is unclear from the stamp which museum or art gallery it was sent to, with the sheer scale of works that were distributed, trying to trace the provenance of just one painting is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Peacock has undergone substantial art historical research and has received positive scientific analysis and attribution, yet its provenance, or lack of, has become an increasing cause for concern. Dr Anthony Parton first saw this work in December 2007, and after analysing the painting in person, he believed it to be genuine. Subsequently, the painting was sold to a Russian collector, who later claimed the painting to be a forgery. The collector began legal proceedings against the dealer from whom he acquired the painting in 2009, and the case remains ongoing. To add further complications, Peacock was included in Parton's monograph, Goncharova, the art and design of Natalia Goncharova, as a Larionov series of peacocks inspired a response from her, and she embarked upon a series of peacock paintings herself in 1911. When the Russian Ministry of Culture took the publisher to court over the publication of the book, they claimed that a number of institutions supported the claim that peacock was a forgery. As a result of the ongoing court proceedings, a neutral scientific expert was court appointed in 2013, and the Ministry of Culture then referred to this analysis in court as further evidence to support their case. Much like the examination performed in 2005, the court appointed analysis in 2013 evaluated the pigments of peacocks along with the canvas, primer and general aging of the whole painting. The laboratory claimed, however, that they discovered evidence of a secondary painting underneath peacocks, suggesting that an older canvas was used, grinded down and then painted upon by a forger at a later date. Peacocks has faced opposition on two fronts, both from the collector who believes his painting to be a forgery and one from the Ministry of Culture in Russia who support his views. One of the claims that arose from the court appointed analysis was that peacocks had been overpainted, something they say is characteristic of a forgery. Larionov was known to have painted over the top of used canvases, as canvas was a particularly expensive commodity in the early 20th century, so executing a new work on the canvas of an older work was not an uncommon practice, and was carried out by other well-known artists such as Picasso in his painting The Tragedy from 1903. Peacocks continues to be at the epicentre of a legal battle 12 years since it began in 2009. In addition, the court case between the Russian Ministry of Culture and the publisher of Parton's book singled Peacocks out as a particularly damning example of a forgery, and the book was banned from sale in the territories of the Russian Federation. The fierce debate endures surrounding the authenticity of the painting, and because little is known about the history of the work since its conception, the physical painting itself is all there is to go off. So it should hopefully become apparent that there is no clear-cut way to discern a fake or a forgery, and as such there is no universally agreed way to deal with them. In some extreme cases, the works are destroyed, often as the result of the expert opinion, ruling that the work has been forged. Now is it right to do this, morally, ethically and historically? If a work discovered to be a fake or a forgery is demolished on the opinions of people working today, how do we know that developments in the future couldn't tell a different story? This is a very real contemporary issue and it is one that needs urgently addressing because destroying an artwork is a permanent decision and is one that cannot be revoked. What if today's forgeries turn out to be tomorrow's discoveries? As a society, we often think about authenticity in explicitly good and bad binary categories. Yet, is there not inherent value in a work as a result of its craftsmanship, the execution, the aesthetics of a piece that should be, that should not be constrained to the capitalist ideologies associated with the art market and the value of a piece. This is in essence what Larionov was proffering in 1913. There is no such thing as a copy, only ever an authentic work of art with the same departure point that I featured on my introductory slide. Why then in modern Western societies are successful forgeries not valued as highly in any way as original works of art? If the narrative change within cultural institutions to adapt to a different way of viewing fakes and forgeries, the opinions surrounding them in Western culture would begin to change too. Copying art was always the way that young artists and apprentices learned their craft working alongside the master artist. And yet, time and time again, the notion that only art matters when it is the real thing creates an echo chamber continually perpetuated in society. It is key that to changing our perceptions about the world of fakes and forgeries and disputes over authenticity that we need to begin to reevaluate the terminology and the notion of worth we place upon art. He who knows a thousand works of art knows a thousand forgeries, something that is not necessarily a bad thing at all.
thanks very much. I will stop screen sharing now.